On this hunt, I cross our southern border for a rare opportunity to hunt a free-range herd of wild buffalo. An animal so iconic, I wrote a whole book on the subject. If you spook these things, they're gone, man. I mean, they're over the next mountain, just you're not gonna find them. When it comes to being a buffalo hunter, there's a lot more to it than just pulling the trigger. That's the gall sack right there. Oh, that is vile. I'm Steven Ranella. To me, hunting isn't only about the pursuit of an animal. It's about who we are and what we're made of. It's about sustenance, survival. It's about connecting to the land. It's about the purity of the challenge. It's about life. In each and every one of us, there is a primal instinct to hunt and consume. I live to hunt and hunt to live. I am a meat eater. In my mind, there's no more American of an activity than hunting buffalo. For some 13 or 14,000 years, thousands of indigenous Americans lived off the meat. And when our own European ancestors came here, they found some 32 million of the animals, and they hunted them for meat and made fortunes off their hides for another 200 years. So if it is so American, why am I in Mexico to do it? The answer to that has to do with contemporary buffalo politics. Basically, in the US, if you want to hunt a buffalo, you either got to draw one of the coveted few tags that they give out through lotteries, or you're hunting inside high wire fences. But here, you can do a legitimate, honest, fair chase hunt for buffalo on private ground. So if we can get one, and I'm just after a good eating young animal, we're gonna be able to have an international, multicultural buffalo fiesta with some of the cowboys who work on this actual piece of land. This is the vast Sonoran Desert, where an isolated string of low mountains is home to a free roaming herd of buffalo. I'm hunting on a sprawling cattle ranch where a dozen cowboys and a couple cooks live a traditional and close to the bone lifestyle. In this dry country, ranchers walk a fine line between making a living and going bust, which makes it especially impressive that they've had the generosity to tolerate a bunch of wild thousand pound critters that drift through drinking precious water and eating precious grass. But with that said, they still like to keep the buffalo herd at a manageable level. And that's where buffalo hunters like me come in. And I'm more than happy to take one off their hands. You might see all this cactus and all this rock and think that this is like a crazy place for buffalo, which we associate with the American prairie and grasslands. But in truth, they were widely distributed at the time of European contact, from the Yukon to northern Mexico and from Maryland to eastern Washington. They were an animal of the continent, not just the American West. Right now, we have 500,000 buffalo in North America. 94% of those exist on private lands or are privately owned. Some of them are run like livestock, and some of them are run like this herd, totally free range. The herd that lives here, they guess there's maybe 80 or 100 of them, was just based on 10 cows and one bull that got let go in these hills. And that was 35 years ago. They've been running wild here since then. I've got tens of thousands of acres that I could walk across. So my plan is to concentrate my glassing efforts on areas that offer both grass and a bit of overhead cover. Because in this hot weather, I expect to find buffalo lying in the only place that is sane, the shade. 200 years ago, when guys were hunting herds of 10,000 rather than herds of hundreds, on hot days, they'd see clouds of what looked like water vapor coming off herds beyond ridges. In cold weather, they'd see clouds of steam coming up off buffalo from con you know, condensation from their breath. They would find flocks of birds that would associate with buffalo. And they'd see them hovering over a mountain and go there and find those buffalo underneath there. But that was at a time when people described herds as like moving across the land like shadows from clouds. Massive, massive groups of animals. I tell you, man, it is hotter than hell down here. If 
it wasn't so thorny, I'd be hunting my G-string. You know, buffalo hunters, man, they died from the cold a lot, dying of hypothermia, but they also died from the heat. Dehydration was a killer. With some kinds of hunting, the trick isn't so much finding the game as getting into range. Free roaming buffalo are the opposite. Their wandering ways make them hard to locate, but once you do find them, it's not likely that they'll give you the slip. Bunch of buffalo bedded down. Bunch of buffalo bedded down. There's maybe a dozen of them. They're just all bedded down. I can just see little bits and pieces of them here and there. get it skinned out. The smart thing to do is just keep checking on them. And in the evening when it cools off and they get up and start feeding, we'll be able to pick one out and hopefully kill it. for time to pass with my quarry in clear sight has been a true test of hunting willpower. But this animal is too significant to go rushing into any hasty actions. That shade line is marching across that bottom and they're gonna be in the shade for too long and they're gonna get up for sure then and start feeding. If I take one down now, it means a long night of skinning and butchering, but it's the only way I can ensure the quality of this meat. Even their fallen comrades, man. The way those other ones hang around, you're seeing one of the vulnerabilities that led these things to be so easily annihilated with uncontrolled hunting, is a hide hunter would just shoot one. Then as soon as one started to break, he'd shoot another one. And that's what they call it a stand. It would be very common to shoot a dozen or 13 or as many as 100 out of one group just like this, bam, bam, bam. When one tries to leave, shoot him. If one gets out ahead of everybody else, shoot him. You just control the herd until you annihilate it. And that's what those hide hunters did. Nowadays, we act, we use a lot more restraint. It's a female just a few years old. It's substantially smaller than a big mature bull, but this is more than enough meat to fill my freezer and still have plenty to share with others. The first thing I'm gonna do is just cut its throat to bleed it out good. That helps me a lot. Killing an animal of this magnitude has an impact, and to take this animal's life and turn it into usable material requires dedication and effort. My job has just begun. It's cooled off, but it's not cool enough. Even if you skin it and gut it, 
you still have a big amp like this still traps a lot of heat. So you'll get like under here in the thick spots, back here around the ball joints particularly, deep in the hams, that stuff can still sour in the heat. So we need to get it all skinned, definitely gutted. By then it's gonna be way past dark. So best thing to do is just crash here for the night, sleep here, make sure nothing gets on it and gets after it. So I don't wanna cut it up and leave it. I mean, there's like a lot of, you get lions out here, a lot of coyotes, something's gonna get in there. So I think just start by getting half it skinned, then we'll gut it and then we'll start quartering it. I'm committed to taking care of this meat to the highest degree possible. It's a rare and beautiful opportunity to get your hands on meat of this quality. It's lean, it's mild, it's tender, and it's highly versatile. I can use this stuff for everything from carpaccio to jerky. What you wanna do is get the, all this so it's up off the ground, there's air circulating around so it can breathe. So now the sun's down, it's just gonna cool. Hopefully it'll develop a nice skin on it, like a nice rind. But the more air circulation, the better. You got a little breeze coming up, eventually the breeze coming this way. Oh, it's already switching downhill. It's just gonna blow on its meat and cool it real nice. I'm cutting away the loin now. I call it the hump meat. They like that part right up here. That's the buffalo's hump. As it gets dark, I'm happy to get this thing down to a manageable level. But this butchering job is only beginning. It's been three hours since taking down my buffalo, and there's still plenty of work that needs to be done. Look, these things are so big. Everything's so heavy, it's just hard to do what you need to do. I got this thing skinned out. Everything's cooling off nicely. Everything's drying up nicely. I just want to grab the heart out of this gut pile, put that out, and now I'm gonna pull out some liver. One thing I've always read about but never tried is a bizarre recipe that Euro-American hide hunters picked up from the Indians on the Great Plains. I can't tell you how reluctant I am to try this, but I almost have to try it. Hide hunters, and I've read the Indians would do this. They would sprinkle gall from a gallbladder on the meat and season it that way. First thing I want to do is try a little piece of liver without gall, just so I have something to compare it to, so. That's perfectly palatable. Tastes like liver. Now, that's the gall sack right there. There's maybe about four ounces of gall in there. So what we want to do is cut a little spout. Just going to put a little drib on that piece. First thing I want to do is just try this stuff. Oh, wow. Man, that is exactly the same sensation as putting your tongue on the end of a nine volt battery. So here's a gall-soaked hunk of liver. Man. 
Oh, that is vile. Good God. Oh. God, that's vile. With that experience checked off my life's to-do list, I decided to cook the rest of my dinner in a more conventional fashion. This time, fire charred liver. Hold the gall. Much, much better. I've done all I can for now. My buffalo is gutted, skinned, quartered, and hanged up to dry and cool off. In the morning, I'll need help getting this animal out of here. It would take me all day to get this meat off the mountain, so I call in for a little help, and I'm more than happy for the arrival of some horsepower. Don and Beto are ranch hands whose family has worked this ranch for some 50 years. They offered to help me pack out, and I offered to give them a bunch of meat. It's a fair trade. These guys obviously have cut up way more big animals, like cattle and buffalo, than I ever have or ever will. So you're really just watching the masters at work, you know? I'm gonna pull the tongue out of here. It's very fatty, it's very good. You boil it up and you peel the skin off and it, it really is phenomenal, it's really good. I always wanna get in there and do everything myself, but at times, just practice a little restraint, man. Just watch people do stuff and learn something. Soon enough, the horses are loaded and we make our way back down to the ranch. It's about time for some heavy duty eating. Back at the ranch, these guys show me how to prepare carne seca, a technique developed for meat preservation. Large cuts of buffalo are carefully sliced into long, flat sheets of meat. That's nice. These are then salted generously and then hung out in the sun to dry over the course of two or three days. This is one of those things that's highly adapted to the location in which you live. Like, you wouldn't lay meat out like this in Homer, Alaska, where you would just then watch it rot. But here it's just, I mean, look at the sky, man. It's just absolutely dry. You don't even feel sweat here, it dries so fast. Ah, this is dog proofing right here. Later, the dried meat can be used in a number of ways. For instance, it can be pulverized, then rehydrated to make what is called machaca, which looks almost like pipe tobacco made out of meat. It's bueno. Me gusta. A buffalo provides so much meat, you can't help but want to get together to celebrate the bounty. So we round up the ranch crew for dinner, and as we cook up a feast, I get a few lessons on just how food works around here. I was asking how they like to cut it for the grill. It's just like that way of cutting the dry meat, but it's, you know, a quarter inch thick. And just really careful to cut into all the meat, kind of like almost butterfly it out. And the steel. <laughs> In addition to the grilled meat, known as carne asada, the ranch chef, Chada, is preparing homemade flour tortillas for shredded buffalo tongue, or lingua de buffalo, as well as corn tortillas for the ranch favorite, Corazon, heart sauteed with tomatoes, onions, and peppers. About as authentic as you can get. Mm. 
This experience in Mexico has both educated me and challenged me. In the early 1900s, there were as few as 75 buffalo left in the United States, possibly none in Mexico. And we can be proud that we're now up to a half million of these animals. Our most iconic beast is once again on our dinner plate. The mystifying thing about the buffalo is that it's such a mixed and contradictory symbol. By nearly exterminating the animal and then working hard to bring it back again, we as hunters created an emblem of captivity and freedom, extinction and salvation, greediness and generosity, a frontier forgotten and a frontier remembered. A question I often get from non-hunters is how can you claim to love the very animals that you kill? And I think of the buffalo every time I answer. I say that it's complicated, that hunting creates an open dialogue with nature that is not easily explained, that you have to learn to live with paradox, that you can stand in the rain and look toward the sun.